welcome. You are listening to the Lai Lama podcast. I'm Gunjan. I'm Rajiv. Today we are having a thoughtful chat with our guest, Dr. Monica Chadha. Dr. Monica is a rehab chiropractor with a clinic Bodybility, based out of Toronto. She is also an author and a host of the book and podcast. Who do you think you are? Dr. Monica was born and brought up in Canada in a very traditional Hindu Punjabi household. She finds community with LGBTQ2IA plus community and has been sharing her journey of coming and been sharing her journey of coming out of South Asian women and all has trans and all that has transpired with and within it. Over to you, Dr. Monica. Thank you so much, Rajiv and Gunjan, for having me today. I'm so glad to be here. Welcome. Yeah, Anything so more to add? No, that was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. yeah, so Monica, tell us or tell the listeners, you know, some of the backdrop story, you know, you know, chat that, you know, the prep chat we had, you had shared some very wonderful you know, story of your childhood and, you know, how you realize that, you know, you have a different preference than the majority. You know? So, you know, the homosexuality, that stigma and everything. And how did you step out of it? How did you fight against, you know, the norms? And the interesting thing is because this is, we are talking about Canada, not country like you know we are going to assume like in India where it is still suppressed where we assume that you know people are very forward looking and they have already stepped into the 22nd century yeah so you know you bring up a really good point saying that it 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 should feel easier here <laughs> and I feel like yes. because of my because of my upbringing and how uh, when I was a child, just what was told to me or just what I was seeing around me, um, I'm still in some ways stuck in that mind frame of like even talking to the both of you, knowing the, you know, the backgrounds of where you come from, I must, I'm still feeling a little hesitation out of myself here to even bring up, hey, you know, I am in the LGBTQ community. Uh, I identify as, you know, part of that queer community. And um, as a kid, I feel like that wasn't even something I knew about. It wasn't talked about. I didn't know anybody that was. Um, and so when I started to look at, you know, other females with, with interest that felt similar to the interest that I had towards males, I was very confused. But at the same time, I was like, oh, maybe this is just normal. Like, this is what probably everyone feels, but I'm supposed to like the guy. And mm. we just don't talk about the rest. And yeah. uh, majority of my, like, childhood and teenagehood was spent with that idea that I just don't talk about the, the part that nobody else talks about. But I also came from a family that we didn't talk about liking anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You just you, you hate a, you, yeah, you hate school. everybody equally. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, right? Like you <laughs> I didn't get to experience talking about like, oh, there's this boy I like at school. It was just as bad as saying uh, there's this girl I like at school. So both of them were wrong. <laughs> Focus on your studies. <laughs> Focus on your studies, right? And if you have other time at home, then clean your room. Right? Like, <laughs> But aside so, from that, like those thoughts. So, so when were, did you, so when, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, in school, you started noticing that you have, you feel more attracted to girls than boys. Was that the realization or did this realization come to you at a later stage? Uh, like you're saying, you know, you can maybe university, college or, you know, mm -hmm. at what point of life did you confront that lie and say, hey, you know, Maybe I am not part of the majority. Yeah, I I don't know a, a big defining point. Um, I know I was attracted to both. And so for me, it was just like, well, I'm allowed to hang out with females. 
right? So my friends can come mm-hmm. over and they have to be female. Most guys couldn't come over to my house. And so it was just easier to like women and be around women, but I was attracted to both. I think the big realization for me happened probably near the end of my um, high school years into university. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of university, I was in a relationship with a woman. Um, And so, yeah, that's, I don't know exactly when, but I know from even from childhood, it, it just was a thing. I didn't think there was a difference between liking either gender. Uh, Monica, I remember in our earlier conversation, you did mention that uh, you were really inspired by Bollywood and wanted to have a fat Bollywood kind of a wedding and all. And this is something, it's um, my complaint to Bollywood or to Karan Johar movies. And I'm sharing this very personal story here at this platform. Uh, COVID days, we were watching back-to-back movies and we watched few Karan Johar movies. And my son was giggling, laughing. Next morning, he came up to me and said that, Mama, we are not watching Karan Johar movies anymore. And I I asked him why. He said he brings up LGBTQ community for comic relief. I'm becoming a teenager and I don't know what is going inside me. I really don't know what's going inside them and there's no help for them. Please never, ever bring such movies at home. I was like, okay, fair enough. We'll not, not watch it. And again, in Bollywood, we talk about sexuality part. We never talk about emotion part. Mm -hmm. And what is that emotion? How do you bring that emotion? That, okay, and you just accepted that, okay, this is who I am. How do you bring that in? First of all, I love your son. (laughs) (laughs) He, and he I is very, love he's very, you know, I, I would say talk to him some you because I've talked to him a couple of times. He is very sharp with you. <laughs> he, he is different, yes. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. And yeah. uh, I think it's great too that you're cultivating this supportive environment, and having those tough conversations. Because I can only imagine, um, you know, you probably grew up with the similar things that I did, right? Similar standards and morals yeah. and ethics of our culture. And so um kudos to you as well for having those tough conversations but um yeah I find you know movies and everything lead to so much of the discussion around sex yet for a culture that doesn't talk about sex it's such (laughs) it's something that we look at and we're like don't talk about it but then only when (laughs) it's comical or used against you can we talk about it yeah there's this big and surprisingly and surprisingly you know Kama Sutra was written and originated. <laughs> <laughs> so, so think about the lies that we tell ourselves, you know, and we say we are very cultural, but we have no idea about what our culture is all about. No, it's all uh, all, all taken in uh, little strides and turned into whatever we want, right? But And that we... actually is... Sorry, go ahead. No, finish your thought. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. In terms of the emotional, I feel like no, nobody really gave it any thought. There's no space for emotion. There's no space for really talking it out. And so that's also kind of the experience I had was I have these thoughts and they are probably wrong because the only thing that was happening in my mind was I like this person, therefore I must want to have sex with this person or that person. There was no thought about what actually did it mean right because mm. even I was hung up on whatever everyone else kind of experienced in that realm of it wasn't about liking another human being it was wrong to even think about a relationship with somebody past friendship doesn't for me it didn't matter which gender they were I was raised with a very strict set of rules of you will just have friends they will be female all the guys stay out of the house And that's it. And so I didn't have room to really figure out emotionally what that even meant till much later, probably in my 30s. So, you know, I feel like that part of it is very new to me in the in the last decade of really experiencing the emotion behind coming out 
and realizing, you know, I went through my own journey of, am I a lesbian? Am I bisexual? Am I pansexual? Like, what am I? Do I want to be a woman? Do I want to, you know, um, have an operation? Do I want to be a male? Like, I went through such a vast journey of exploring who I am, because all of a sudden, when I started to live on my own, I had space to explore the emotion hmm. and to figure out what was it that I actually want rather than what was I, what were the set of rules I was raised with and what was I telling myself as well through those years just to survive. So you didn't have anybody to talk to, sister, friends, nobody. You did not share it with anyone. So I, I had um, until my last year in university I think until then I didn't tell anybody I didn't come out um I believe I came out in 2005 or 6 so end of university 2007 maybe um so I didn't tell anybody you know my friends and I would joke in high school like we're watching a movie and, you know, Ashraya Rise on screen and all three of us, my best friends at the time, females, <laughs> all three of us were like, wow, she's so hot. She would be my she wife. And I was like, oh, OK, everyone feels this way. This is totally <laughs> fine. Right. And so they were joking, but I was like, this is cool. Serious. Serious. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Right. For that matter, I like Sushmita more. I do too. <laughs> I like Sushmita more. <laughs> <laughs> I like them both in case they're both watching. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that's a, it, so when you know, when let's say you started talking to when you started realizing that hey, you know, this is who I really am. And so how did you start actually did like you know what Kunja was saying? Did you have any close circle of friends or confidantes that you know you would talk to and because I'm sure it would be, you know like immense, you know, I would say torture for an individual just bouncing off thoughts in their own head, right? Because it's the huge movements of self-doubt, you know, the, you know, confidence, self-esteem, everything gets impacted because uh, unless you have somebody else to talk to. So, so in 2004, I think I was in an internship with under an undergrad and I was shadowing a chiropractor named Dr. Brian Dower in Toronto. And uh, actually we were in Scarborough in a clinic, which is like a little more diverse area uh, than most of the suburbs at that time. <laughs> and mm. now everything feels more diverse, which is cool. Um, and he and I were just talking, doing clinical things. And um, I'm not exactly sure how it came up, but he had mentioned his partner. And he was with a, a male partner uh, for many years. And I was kind of taken aback that I was actually talking very closely, intimately to somebody who's living this lifestyle. Obviously, he was an Indian, but I was like, oh, this is cool. I get like a kind of an inside view on what that life is like. He's a professional doctor. He's got a professional partner. They have a beautiful life. They have children that they share. They go on, you know, beautiful trips together. They have a whole life. And that was very, very, uh, I think one of the big moments for me to realize maybe something like this is possible for me. But then I was like, Nigora, right? Like, <laughs> yes, exactly. Not exactly. happening in the Indian household. Yeah. It's, it's not yeah. happening for me. Um, and then eventually, I think, I don't know if it's weeks or months later, I had told him that I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm into women and men. And uh, he was like taken aback too. And he you know, was very open to having conversation with me. He was the, I mean, obviously the first person to tell me, uh, and I was the first person I, I came out to him first. He was the first person I came out to. And the one thing that really stuck with me was what he said was, you have to live your life for you. No matter what you go through in life, I don't care if you marry a guy at the end of the day, do it because you want to do it because you have to live your life for you. Your parents, other family members, they're all going to pass on. 
At some point, everyone's going to be gone and you have to live with your truth. And if you've made decisions to that point that weren't for you, at some point, it's going to catch up to you. And you have to Very be good. Very Yeah, good. so that has stuck with me through pretty much every decision I made from that point on, no matter how scary it was. I just could hear his voice in the background. And I turned to him many, many times uh, in, in times of support that I needed, just as a reminder. And he would just, you know, text me just the right words, like, I'm proud of you, or, you know, you remember this is your life. Like that, those were his words. Uh, and those are continuously his words still. Um, yeah. I, I would say you found the perfect yes mentor inspiration yes. <laughs> and mentor and, and coach. Yes, did it help you to grow professionally? Like, okay, this is who I am, and I do not have any support. If I don't do good professionally, then where do I go? So, did that experience help you to grow professionally? Who you are today as a chiropractor? I think I became a chiropractor because I because of him and that experience, because I originally wanted to go into physiotherapy or some other type of therapy. Uh, it just so happened that our schedules matched best. And so I was like, OK, I'll, I'll shadow the chiropractor. And uh, eventually, if the physio and my um, schedules match up, then I'll switch over. And, uh, you know, nothing, I feel like nothing's ever by mistake. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I was going to say that, you know, maybe this was bound to happen. Yeah. So, you know, one, one thing you mentioned that this is stuck in my mind, you, you know, actually it's not, you know, go ahead and, you know, uh, won't happen in uh, Indian, uh, you know, this thing. But I reflect back, if you look at or read our scriptures, you know, the Indian scriptures, it's full of gender fluid, you know, uh, what would you call it? Fluidity? Yeah. You know, even in Mahabharata, you would even, you know, you can talk about the Krishna's own life, so the God, and the, there's so much of gender fluidity. And yet, you know, I would expect that the, you know, Indian culture would be much more open to respecting and inclusion of who you are, because that's the crux of the you know Indian culture thought that you no know, be true to yourself. And yet here we are that we you know become so close-minded and truth so close that we you know shut out our loved ones <laughs> from our lives because you know they they choose to be who they are. And extending to what Rajiv is saying, there are a few Babas in India who claim <laughs> that there are a few yoga exercises through which we can make things better and uh, make things the way you want them to be. So, yes, over to you, Monica. Yeah, as if it is a disease. Huh? Yeah, as if it's a disease. We can cure it. So, uh, so one thing I would want to ask, uh, Monica, is that, you know, you mentioned pride. Right? Why, why is it considered a matter of pride? And I'm going to give a little example. You know, just about a week ago, I was talking to another friend of mine. And, um, you know, this person, you know, on the surface is very extroverted. But then as we were chatting, you know, the, the person said, you know, Rajiv, I think I'm a closet introvert. <laughs> so, you know, at that time, you know, it was that, hey, you know, I, I said to the person, hey, you know, if you are introvert, you are. But then you know, I, I, I was thinking about our chat today and I said, you know, we use the same terms like, you know, I was a you know, closet uh, lesbian or a gay or whatever, you know, different terms we use for, uh, you know, the inclination towards the you know, same gender. Why would be a, why would be it a matter of pride? The concept of pride started from the riots, the Stonewall riots or the Stonewall uprising uh, in 1969, I think it was. And so that was, you know, members of the gay community that had a response to a police raid um, at the Stonewall Inn. And so the pride, the concept of pride or the pride march is because of kind of in memory of that Stonewall uprising every year. And in support nice. of the gay community standing up for themselves against something against basically police brutality, 
um, at that time. And so every year that's what's commemorated. And it's kind of this notion that, you know, it's, it's the one time that's now continued where we can all gather together to remember that, the, that we had to fight to be equal. Mm -hmm. And so the wow. pride isn't necessarily like I'm proud of myself. Yeah, okay. It's it. the um, ability to stand up against what we were told we were, right? Not being able to go out in public and be a part of regular society safely. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think there is a shift then and now in society as far as acceptance is concerned. In society, you know, depending on where you live, absolutely. Um, I think acceptance is a really funny word. So I'm, I'm yes. glad you brought that up. <laughs> yes. I would. Um, over the last, I would say, couple of years now, I've been playing around with the word acceptance and testing it, testing the waters with that word. And what does it mean to different people? Because I know what it means to me. I know what it says in the dictionary, but what does it actually mean? How, you know, where are people's tolerance levels when it comes to acceptance? Is it this free, no, no boundary acceptance, unconditional acceptance? And I feel like, you know, a better word that really sticks out for me is love rather than mm. acceptance. I don't need people to accept me. No validations, of course. I need them to love me. And whether you love me yeah. as a stranger on the street, leave me alone. You don't know me. You don't have to hate me. You don't have to like me. Just let me be with love. Or whether you're somebody I know and see on a day-to-day -day basis, a family member, a friend, a colleague, right? You can love me in ways as well. You don't have to accept my life. I'm not looking for people to be on board with every decision I make. I, I am super proud of you. <laughs> I'll rephrase my question. You think society's perspective has changed? Yes. <laughs> You're like, Just give me a one word answer. <laughs> <laughs> what about family and friends? Yes. I think they want their perspective to change. I don't think anyone really wants to be against other people. I would hope, mm. right? Um, I think I think people are having a hard time changing their minds, whether whatever they're telling themselves that isn't possible. And then to do the work around it and to educate themselves, that's the hard part. And not everyone's willing to do that work. Yeah, you know, this podcast is all about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I have to share... Uh, personal story here. You know, uh, before I came to US, this is like you know, I, the first time I came to US in 1989, as more as a visitor. And um, but I fell into you know I was in that category of people who hated you know homosexuals because that's what we were brought up with and all that. Like you are saying that it would create a cognitive disson dissonance in my mind, even thinking about, hey, you know, somebody can have a preference of, you know, of a partner of the same gender. Although, if I look back, you know, we have friends, very close friends. You know, other than the sex part, you know, we share everything, you know, with our very, very close friends. So, but when I came to US and I ran into, I was in New York, I ran into a couple of you know, uh, homosexual people, men, and I would find it really, really tough to, you know, even have conversation with them. But then I migrated back to US and, uh, you know, in 92, like, you know, on the migration immigrant visa and all that. And uh, I started working in California. And in my team, we, I had, you know, both uh, you know, gay men and also lesbian women, and I found them so fantastic. You know, I I have very good friends. Uh, you know, I, I became very good friends with them, and one thing came to my mind was that, you know, like uh, Gunjan was saying that the only thing that we are taught about you know being homosexual is the sex part. And when I observed, you know, uh, people in holidays parties and all that. 
they were as attached, as emotional, as happy, as angry. They had all that spectrum of emotion with their partners like I had with my wife. And that was a you know kind of epiphany for me that, hey, why do we consider them different? And that the whatever that you know uh, the term that homophobia has you know, slowly dissolved, and uh, even today you know I am you know in touch with the people that I work with, and uh, we enjoy chats. We talk about families, like you said that you know, uh, you know females end up adopting, you know men end up either surrogating or adopting, or you know uh, women too, and it was beautiful. So. So, you know, I understand what you're saying, you know, acceptance versus perspective. But I think it is, you know, why would, why would we, would we saying that, hey, do you accept me or not? It's like saying, hey, I like, you know, I'm an introvert, would you accept me or not? Or I'm an extrovert, would you accept me or not? It's, it's one of the, you know, state of being. And, uh, you know, this was, I think I would say, my own journey that I took, and uh, you know, I, that's why I'm very excited to talk to you and get some first-hand experience of your journey. You know, I have seen, like you said, that you know, Gora's, because most of the people that I know up here, you know, who uh, you know are you know from this LGBT community, are white or black people, because you know, the Americans, I would say. Thank you for sharing that. You know, as you're. As you were saying it, something popped into my mind and it's these things we do kind of unknowingly, it's still in our language. So even though, you know, your perspective has probably changed and Gunjan is well, yours as well, mine as well on this whole topic, we still look at the LGBT community. I do this, I'm, I'm guilty of it myself as something other than. The yeah. fact that I had to label myself, the fact that you said, you know, I saw these gay people you didn't yeah. just say, I saw this person in a blue shirt, who yeah. is my colleague, who happens to have a partner that is the same sex as them. It was a label, right? Like my colleague who is gay. Yeah. And I feel like even though perspective has changed, the language hasn't, it will mm -hmm. always, that language will always then be attached to the previous perception of it's all about sex. Yes. I don't know why yeah. we're so hyper fixated on sex and especially for a culture that, you know, almost demonizes it to some degree <laughs> in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're expected to have children by magic, but yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's magical. <laughs> <laughs> Very. Yeah, we don't talk about it. <laughs> you know, right? I mean, we just I have that. <laughs> I couldn't even say the word sex properly till probably I was 33 right yeah. even even saying it right now I'm like this is so awkward uh to say out loud like it's but we focused so much on that and even um you know the one of the first questions my dad asked me very innocently at like you know I think he was trying to make sense of it in his head like what is this about why are you mm. into women like I don't understand and his very first question was, is it about the sex? And I didn't know how to answer that. And in, you know, in almost like a rebellious way, because I, I tend not to answer questions straight on. <laughs> I was like, are you, are you with mom because of the sex? Like, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. The question doesn't make sense to me. It's the same question in reverse to everyone else, right? Like, why are you with the person that you're with? Yeah. Nobody. It's all about relationships. Right. And so why is it that for a gay person, a lesbian person, a, a bisexual person, like why all of a sudden do they get the label of sex as the only reason? I know it doesn't happen as much now, um, that is shifting, but I think until the language doesn't continue to change where we don't just say like that gay guy that I know, it's not going to change, right? Because I am more than my sexual identity and I would hope I am because to walk down the street and know that some people look at me as a lesbian person 
-hmm. It's really uncomfortable. It's equal to walking down the street as a very beautiful woman and being catcalled. Mm -hmm. Because you're just a symbol of your body and your sexuality. You're not a human anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing that people talk about, you know, the blacks or the browns. Exactly. And the yellows. <laughs> so, you know, or the fat guy or the fat exactly. guy. So, so, but the thing is that, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, the, I agree with you that the language and all that has to change, but I'm, you know, I'm, I don't think that that's something that would happen in our lifetime. Maybe, maybe not. But the main thing that I think the important thing is that, you know, on one hand, we teach love to our children. Like, you, you know, you talk about your father, right? On one hand, we teach our children, you know, love everybody, hate no one. On the other hand, the moment you love somebody of the same gender, everybody starts hating you or looking at you differently. So what gives? I wish I could answer that. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I remember that story that Monica shared that uh, she reached out to someone and then parents said that, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, go raha hai. I, I remember that. So it's not just loving uh, same gender. It's like loving anybody will be a crime that how can you do that? Yeah. yeah. I, think the, I think the language is changing. Like when I speak to people my age and younger, actually, the younger generations, the language is changing. And Gunjan, you shared about your son. So you can tell that the language is changing and the ideology behind it is changing. Um there's, you know, there's just less of them than there is more of us on the other side of the spectrum of like, you know, having to make this change at a later time in life with all these al already preconceived notions of what we have accepted, what we have lived, the the lies mm -hmm. we tell ourselves, right? So, yeah. um, you know, Gunjan, you bring, you bring up the story of like, I had shared, um, kind of the lie I had to tell myself that I was going to live this life that my parents had dreamt for me, that even I had dreamt for myself, this Bollywood life. Um, and my compromise was I was going to marry a man that I could see myself marrying. And then eventually, you know, when everyone's passed on or I eventually have the strength to do it, I would probably leave the person and go live my life for real. If that's, you know, what the, the road would be for me. Um, and so I brought a guy home and uh, introduced him to my parents and it still wasn't good enough, right? There were so many things. It was like, oh, he's he's still in school. He's not settled. He doesn't have a secure job. And what are you guys going to do? You're not even done with school. And, you know, he's white. He's not Indian. He has to learn our culture. He's American. He's not Canadian. Like, who's going to live where, right? It was just too many layers. And then it made me realize, like, there's going to be no happiness for anybody, no matter what I choose. Every path I go, even if I married their choice of an Indian man, then it would probably be the next thing of when are you having children or you didn't have a boy, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> So at some point, something's got to give. And I was like, okay, if they're not going to be happy every step of the way with the decisions that they're asking me to make based on what they need, and if either way, if I'm going to be in trouble, I might as well just be in trouble. Yeah, but you know, I, I think you did, I, I personally think you did the right thing. Yeah, you know, I'm imagining that, and I, this, when you shared it earlier also, I had the same question that, you know, think about the future you had. You, know, you would have lived a life all through your life. Not only that, let's say you had children. Now you would have been born by the children, you know, by the marriage. By it. So it, it's not that the walls of the prison are going to open just because your own family has passed on. You know, actually there are more and more walls being created by us for ourselves every day of our life, every decision we take. So you are just trapping yourself for the rest of your life being miserable. And I'm very happy for you that you know you did what you did because now at least you are you know happy yes by being who you are yes
And I think if you pause and reflect, you must be glad that at first place, your parents said no, and you got an idea that, okay, nothing can make them happy. I'm not even getting into pleasing them. So I think that was a blessing in disguise, if I can uh, say it like that. And yes, good, you did that, took someone and rather than, you know, they're taking you with a tray of uh, chai and snacks and you're seeing someone in your future. <laughs> So the, the, yeah. the window shopping. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as you, uh, as you said that, Rajiv, I had this image of trying to break through these walls. And uh, sometimes we think we're breaking through walls and really we're actually building new ones and creating yeah. a maze instead of creating a field. And uh, yeah. that image came to mind as you were saying that. But uh, yeah, exactly. you know, I, I firmly believe that, you know, and that's what, that's exactly what, you know, we, you know, both me and Kunchan, we, when we are bouncing off ideas that, hey, you know, we need to address this because I would prefer that, you know, the, you know, not just, you know, I'm like old now from many standards, but, uh, you know, even today, if I reflect back, there's so many walls that I had created, or I still create today. And I have to consciously say, hey, no, this is not acceptable. And, uh, but the wall that you are talking about would have been much, much denser and, you know, deeper. <laughs> you know, there was um, a time I had gotten married to a woman. Uh, and when I had told my parents I was getting married, I did it in a way that, you know, wasn't probably the best way, but it was the only way I knew how to have a conversation without any yelling happening. And so I emailed them and uh, <laughs> I had emailed my dad to say like, this is what's happening. This is when it's happening. Um, you know, I'd love to have a conversation about this, but I wanted you to be able to see all of this without stopping me from having the conversation in, in the middle of it. And, uh, you know, we had met up. Uh, it had not gone well at all. Um, I met with my both my parents and both of them were very like, you know, just not accepting of the situation, obviously, and, and felt very hurt. And then my dad's thing was like, you didn't talk, you didn't give me a chance to really talk about it when you told me, you just told me over email. And um, the reason why I bring this up was many years later, my dad started to come back into my life. So they had cut me out for, I would say about five, four or five years solid. I couldn't get a hold of them. I would write to them, you know, happy Diwali, happy new year, Merry Christmas. I would get no responses, uh, from my entire, my, my brother, my sister-in-law, my mom and my dad. And then about three or four years in my dad started messaging me. And we slowly, slowly started talking. And I said, you know, you're messaging me. I, I am married to this woman. And uh, he had met the two of us. And we went for lunch. We did this maybe a couple of times. And he kind of did this, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, maybe secretly. Because <laughs> my mom wasn't ready. And he was trying to figure out how to bridge the gap hmm. for this. Um, he's always been somebody to bring people together. He's really, really good at that. Um, and when he and I met the first time alone, he said, you know, when you told me, it was a big shock. Like my world was coming crumbling down. And when the dust settled, I didn't know what to do with the information. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I can, there's resources. I didn't know what I could read or see that would help me understand how do we move forward? You just kind of dropped an email and then, you know, everything was gone. There was no room for conversation after the emotions settled. And I said to him, like, all you had to do was reach out, but instead you cut me out. I don't know what to do. Like at the end of the day, I'm the kid <laughs> or the parent. Yes. So yes. I can't parent you through this. I don't even know what to do. I was too busy trying to figure out where my next paycheck was coming from how I was going to pay the bills, how I was going to eat because I had no support. It was like from zero, from hundred to zero, right? Like I had to figure it all out very quickly. And, you know, 
I think both of us at that moment realized how human we were. And we started to build a little bit of a relationship back on just knowing that both of us had no idea what we were doing. There's no way to communicate this. And so I, I had sent him a, uh, uh, in, in Toronto, we had like this regional meeting um, and an Indian family was talking about their son coming out and the whole process this that this um, auntie uncle had of accepting their son and their son-in-law. They were a part of the wedding. They threw a really big wedding. And so I invited my parents to that. My mom didn't want to come and my, my dad didn't want to go without her. But I think that started up more conversation for them at home. And eventually, uh, fast forward another couple of years, like when COVID hit, actually, my mom had reached out to me. And uh, we started talking. She said, you know, I want to meet you somewhere uh, public. Let's just have a conversation together. And so we met. And, you know, I had set some ground rules. I said, if you're going to ask me any questions, be prepared for the answer. And if you don't want to know, don't ask me. But you can't get mad at me for asking for you asking me the question and then getting an answer. So if you're uncomfortable, don't ask me. And so th that was kind of our ground rule. And I said, but eventually you're going to have to ask me the questions yes. because I'm not here to just be the Monica you remember and the Monica you're okay with. I need to be me, but I can be patient. And, you know, fast forward another two years. And uh, recently I had to kind of cut all of them out because at some point the acceptance that I needed wasn't there. Hmm. And, you know, again, I don't, I'm not somebody to close doors on people, but it really is this matter of, I just don't, I'm not in spaces where I'm not loved. Yeah. You should not be. And I think no that's a big yeah. thing for, you know, if I could pass that message to anyone else is like, how would you love yourself? Because that's how other people should love you too. But it starts here, right? It starts here first. Mm -hmm. And that becomes your guard dog for your heart and for you, for your soul. Yeah. And, you know, I, I firmly believe that if you cannot love yourself, there's no way you can love anybody else. And you'll give you know, what you have. You will have. only spread hatred. You'll give only what you have. If you have hatred, you'll give hatred. If you have love, you'll give love. So, uh, yes. But as you were talking, Monica, you know, one of the things that I have often wondered and I still reflect on is that, you know, all over education, everything just prepares us for a job. They do not, it does not prepare us for life. You know, these are the complexities in terms of, you know, the decisions you have to make, the people you love and why and why not and all that. Like you were saying that, you know, I'm, I was reflecting back and thinking that, hey, if, if something similar would happen to me, how would I react? No, I know that I react uh, today. I'm much, much more open minded. Let's say if it had happened to me 30 years ago, how would I have you know, reacted to uh, a similar situation like your dad had? And, uh, you know, on one hand, I can empathize because all the social upbringing, education, everything does not prepare you for life, it only prepares you for job. And that's a pet peeve I have about education and everything that, you know, but these are the things that we should talk about. And, you know, like Kunjan, you're doing with, you know, with your son, but I wish that our generation or, and maybe, you know, I don't know how many of our, or even next generation is actually willing to talk about all these things. Mm -hmm. But these are important things that we need to talk about. And um, Monica, you've gone through, been through a lot. Uh, Anyone who's seeking support or is having those crises or there's a battle going on inside, where and how they can reach out for help? Yeah, so, you know, different uh, countries, different cities have their own um, support groups. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to start. I think, you know, finding a therapist, that was the biggest thing for me was psychotherapy or psychologist. Um somebody who is more open-minded for sure. So, you know, there's so much online now that you can find to find a person to talk to 
every step of the way is a really big deal. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very grateful I had access to be able to do that. Um, and then, you know, Rajiv, you made a really good point. You know, our education didn't prepare us for life. And I think it's an unfair expectation to expect our degree to prepare us for life. Our degree is to prepare mm -hmm. us for career, but not to forget the people we meet in that journey, right? I was so focused on like, okay, if I become a doctor, they'll be happier. If I open my own business, they'll be really happy for me. If I make the money, they'll be happy for me. If I buy the home, they'll be happy. If I buy the car, they'll be happy. The part that I'm starting to really go microscopic on are all the people I met while I was trying to buy that car, while I was trying mm -hmm. to buy the house, while I was going through the education, while I was trying to open the business. And every step of the way, I met people that inspired my life outside of my career. And so the career was one way for me to connect and build relationships. And, you know, I, I feel very grateful I had that experience. And I'm hoping that if other people were to look with a magnifying glass at their own lives and their careers that way as well, they might also have a similar experience. It's, it's the people you're meeting on that path that will prepare you for your life. Yeah. And uh, that's where my focus is now turning to is, you know, the not just the big experience of like the end goal, but those little processes that got got me there. And having support groups or finding community, Gunjan, is really important. Um, in Toronto, there's the 519 community. Uh, I know I'm sure in, in uh, California, there's a ton as well. Oh, yeah, and I know yeah. in India, there's starting to be some big groups as well. Um, and so finding community, for me at least, is a really big deal, which I'm focusing on this year. Um, and finding somebody who, uh, you know, therapy is a great way to go. Because that's somebody who is there to support you no matter what, and hopefully with an unbiased perspective of you. Yeah. I think the main thing also is if you know, people, the listeners, whenever you talk about it, keep the sexuality part outside. It is not about sex. It's more about relationships. Emotions. You know, and it does not really matter, you know, who you truly love. You know, I've seen people, you know, they love their cars more than their, you know, spouses or their kids. You know, so <laughs> what would you call that? <laughs> right. Well, thank you so much for joining. That was really insightful. And somewhere I was crying inside that, oh my God, little kid doesn't have to go all through that. But then it was not just kid, it was teenage. And then there are stages where you go through certain degree of emotions, but it was a wonderful story, uh, Monica. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And Rajiv has written some beautiful couplet for you. Over to you, Rajiv. Yeah, but before I say any any closing comments from you, Monica, any uh, just, more messages? Yeah. Just thank you so much for having me here and, and being able to hold this space in a, a conversation that's, you know, not very typical for me amongst South Asian cultures. So it was really, I feel like it's almost healing to be able to do this in a place where, you know, people look like me. <laughs> <laughs> have not the <laughs> Well, no, it's just like the similar upbringing, right? Yeah. And so even if, you know, we weren't the same skin color or same religion or same culture, if that upbringing is still the same, if the experiences are still the same, being able to share these stories and kind of being able to see the other side of it, whether it be positive or negative, it's it's not always going to be great. My, I feel like the end result of my story isn't great, but I'm trying to make it great. And that's yeah. I think our power as a human being is no matter what we go through, it's our job to take care of ourselves when we can. And if you have that ability and if you have that realization, then, you know, you're in complete control of what you get to do next. And, you know, by all means, finding that safety within yourself and finding that love for yourself within yourself is is where I think it all begins. Yeah. 
Thank you yes, for having absolutely. me. Absolutely. No, no, it was really, really good. And you know, you mentioned that your story is closing, but I think no, your story is still long. <laughs> you have you know many, many, many years to go. And uh, I, I I think that you know, whoever is listening, and if your you know, family, your friends happen to listen to this episode, it's love. It's it has nothing to do with them, it has nothing to do with anybody else. Think about that. If your child is happy, what else would you ask for? You know, we, we it, it's not about the money you make. It's not about the career you have. It's the happiness. If you are who you are and you're happy to be who you are, I think that's the best thing I, I could wish for my children. And I, I, I hope that, you know, people who are listening would wish the same. But on that, you know, I, uh, I wrote this couplet uh, after we talked because you know, that was the first thought that came to me. That and uh, you know, uh, it's in Hindi, so I'll uh, speak a little slow. <laughs> so, जो मुझे कभी अपने दिल का टुकड़ा कहते थे, आज मेरे अंतिम संस्कार को भी ना आएंगे। ये प्यार की दो धारी तलवार एक तरफ समाज की जंजीरें काटती है और दूसरी तरफ जन्म के रिश्ते थैंक यू सो मच राजीव दैट वाज रियली सोल टचिंग लास्ट वर्ड्स फ्रॉम यू मोनिका यू नो जस्ट अम अ थॉट दैट काइंड ऑफ केम टू माय माइंड समथिंग आई हैड रिटन इन माय बुक एंड एंड इफ यू डोंट माइंड मी शेयरिंग इट ओह एब्सोल्युटली दे वरंट हु यू एक्सपेक्टेड देम टू बी you weren't who they expected you to be either instead of expecting from one another what if you tried loving one another wow. very nice very nice very nice thank you thank you so much for listening and all i want to say in end is be true to yourself